Ah, ok. Attendi isso. Mm -hmm. Ok, very good. You know the Anton, it's, I think it's possible that we started already actually, we don't know it. I think it's the case. So then, then we should anyway start because the recording is, is there. Uh, so it is my pleasure to uh, chair and welcome you all uh, at this uh, annual event, which is uh, a part of uh, the series of open lectures uh, sponsored by the Institute of Physics. Uh, and hosted by the physics team of the University of Wolverhampton. So it is a tradition that every year, uh, every October, uh, the, the lecture on uh, the current year uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, its laureates and uh, the actual physics behind it uh, is given by Professor Fabrice Lassie, uh, the head of the physics course uh, and uh, chair on uh, in light matter interactions here at the University of Wolverhampton. Now, Professor Lassie is, although Professor Lassie is a, a renowned uh, world expert in his field of research, which is quantum optics and uh, the physics of light matter interactions, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, is awarded uh, for significant achievements in most of the time uh, in other fields of uh, domains of physics, unfortunately, uh, which makes uh, giving this lecture additionally challenging for, uh, for our speaker. Uh, however, uh, the goal of uh, promoting physics, uh, science uh, in general, and uh, even more generally, uh, scientific critical way of thinking uh, to which uh, our speaker is dedicated uh, is certainly worth uh, the challenge. Uh, now, I would also like to add that uh, Professor Lassie does brilliantly uh, to avoid or minimize the discussion uh, of the political aspect of uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I'm personally looking forward uh, to see uh, how he manages this time. Uh, finally, I would like to kindly ask you to prepare your questions uh, and uh, post them after the talk or uh, type them in the chat window which is attached uh, to, to this room. So without further ado, please I give you the professor I give you Professor Lassie, the virtual stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Dianton. It's a pleasure to give this uh, annual lecture on the Nobel Prize indeed which, as Anton said, started as a little um, uh, exercise. In 2005, I was postdoc in the University of Sheffield, and Mark Fox uh, was uh, having a series of seminars there, asked me to speak about something which was not related directly to my research. Um, and uh, in 2005, the Nobel Prize was given um, to Glober, among other people, for the um, theory of quantum optics, which was my field. And then I thought that there was a loophole there, I could be talking about my research through the Nobel Prize and relate my results at the end to sneakily introduce my slide at the end after discussing uh, other things, not only the, the science of Glober, but the character uh, bits about the Nobel Prize, which is a very interesting prize. Everybody knows about it. Everybody awaits it. There are lots of anecdotes. It's a very interesting topic in general. I did this in 2005. Then much later in 2012, I did it again in Madrid this time. Um, because uh, Arroche and Wineland uh, got the Nobel Prize for, uh, again, quantum optics, something pretty similar. And uh, I, I did it on this second occasion. And when I uh, joined Wolfram-Ton, uh, well, I, I had to explain students uh, what is physics, how we do physics, and what makes a physicist different from other scientists. Uh, I like very much to uh, use this, uh, these talks I was giving, which were not on my research. It's a very interesting exercise to speak of something of which you are not an expert. And then we uh, imagine indeed this little game of um, to illustrate the, uh, the description of the physicist, that is that uh, it's someone who knows something about everything and everything about something. So the everything about something is what we do as researchers. You know, everything about, I don't know, in my case, I would say maybe the Molo triplets or things like this. Or Anton would know everything about, uh, about, Z, uh, or about topological insulators, or things like that. But uh, physics being the science of the universe, it means that you can't specialize too much into your field uh, because otherwise you will actually miss important aspects of it. You must be able to uh, look what other people do. 
And um, you realize in this way that even for research that is not related at all to what you think uh, other people are doing, there is a link, there are lots of links. We will illustrate this point today through the work of Parisi, who actually uh, looked at very particular system and we will conclude at the end, we'll see that it connects with basically everything else which is uh, interesting, which is uh, a complicated, a co complex system. They're all described by something that uh, Parisi looked, which is very particular case, very particular system. So um, that was this little exercise. This year, uh, Nobel Prize was given to these three people. We see them as they are being drawn by these artists uh, since, uh, who since a few years is drawing them with, with gold color. This yellow is supposed to be the color of gold. That's how they look like in, uh, in real life. Need to click on the thing. So they look pretty much the same. I think I got them in the right order, right? So we've got Manabe, uh, the Japanese scientist, Parisi, Italian scientist, and Asselman, German scientist. And uh, we'll go into the detail of what they got, maybe for people who's joined us, uh, these IOP lectures, uh, I want to uh, make a little uh, drawback of the previous uh, Nobel Prize that we discussed together, if you remember, so it is the one of 2019, two years ago, that's the first IOP Nobel lecture. It was given to the field of cosmology. And uh, interestingly, a bit like this year, the, the format of the winner, this, uh, this previous year, is given to one very important, very famous, very prestigious person, with Paris in this case, and two others that are more outsiders, people that are maybe a bit less famous, uh, Manabi and Asselman. It was the case here where we had people was Peebles with someone uh, very famous. And uh, Mayo and Kilos, I believe, were known by the experts. Now everybody knows them, but at the time, maybe only people with special interest in what they were doing, which is exoplanet, um, really knew about them. Uh, and that's a picture of the talk at this occasion. We are discussing the Doppler shifts with an uh, important character. I, I got this slide from Anton, actually. Anton is our chairman. And uh, last year, 2020, it was uh, almost the same topic again, uh, cosmology and uh, sort of thing. And same pattern, very important person, very famous that everybody knew beforehand, Penrose in this case on the left, and two other people who are much less famous for the wide public of scientists or even, even physicists. I don't know how many people knew Genzel and Gaze before the Nobel Prize. Um, and this year we've got something similar. So last year was an online lecture. That's me uh, of last year. I look pretty much the same. I hope I didn't change too much. And now let's look at um, our rate for this year. So as I said, um, the, they got the Nobel Prize for the uh, nomination that covers everybody. And the nomination is groundbreaking contribution to our understanding of complex system. And we see that complexity has a lot to do indeed for the work of all of them and that it might be a link indeed between their work, even though the link is not so, so direct as, as one could imagine, possibly. And the format of the Nobel Prize is that uh, we'll see the rules later on. Half of it goes to someone. So it goes to the one that they put in the middle on this occasion. It's the one who, who got the, the prize for one aspect of the, of the work. And the qualification for this one reads, discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical system from atomic to planetary scale. And, and it's a very funny description of, of the prize, of what he, uh, the achievement for which he got the thing. It's, it's not specific at all. If you think of Einstein, for instance, Einstein got the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. So he won one particular, one well-identified aspect of Einstein's considerable, considerable work. For Parisi, it looks like he, he basically invented statistical mechanics, right? Because uh, not only he connects disorder and fluctuation, which are extremely general, that would be possibly the definition of statistical mechanics, but also that he applied it to everything. Yeah, a physical system from atomic to planetary scale. I don't know what is not uh, outside of this description. So it's a big, bit too general, right? We'll see that actually got the price for something much more specific. Even though he was himself a bit like Einstein, very versatile and look at a lot of different things, but the, the actual uh, prize was, was something very specific. And then the other half was shared between these two other scientists. So uh, one for uh, each, therefore, and it was for the physical modeling of Earth's climate. And then this uh, qualification for the other part, for the other uh, half of the prize, is for both of them, right? They don't make a difference. So this difference is mine. Why? Because they have been put on both sides of Paris, so it was difficult to find a way to write the qualification uh, for them, but also because it makes sense to break it in this way. I believe that actually Manabi uh, mainly worked on modeling the Earth climate, as we would discuss, and the other one, Asselman, it was for this quantifying variability and, uh, and predicting global warming. And this, if you compare to Parisi, is much more specific, right? 
Uh, modeling Earth climate, even in this uh, broadest understanding, will be still something quite specific, it's limited to climate and uh, so on and so forth. And even uh, the same for SEMA. So it's interesting this imbalance and the symmetry breaking between these uh, three scientists. Okay. So a few things about the prize itself. Uh, if you are interested in this, in the prize rather than the actual uh, laureates of today, of this year that we will discuss in more detail, I invite you to look at the previous recording. They are on YouTube and uh, there we discuss what was uh, promised in the abstract. If you read the abstract where I say that, I will tell you funny anecdotes or fights uh, between funny things about the prize. So not to repeat myself, I will uh, not discuss too much this aspect now and we will focus on, on this year's prize. But still, so it's important to know that the prize, the kind of an old institution, yes, yeah, since last century, uh, 1901, and it concerns these uh, five very important fundamental aspects of science, physics, chemistry, medicine, biology, physiology, well, all, all these things that relate about, uh, about living stuff, literature and, and peace. So it's not science in particular, right? Because literature and peace in particular uh, are completely, um, completely related to art science. You notice as well that it's missing important over things like, I don't know, mathematics is not there. So the legend says it's because the wife of, uh, of Nobel had, um, had some uh, personal inkling to, to not mathematics, but as a topic, but to a mathematician. So he decided to remove mathematics, but it's, I think it's, an, uh, it's not true, it's apocryphal. Um, the Testament of Nobel is really interesting to read and will not read this, of course, and will not even read the translation. I just want to emphasize something really important that Nobel wanted uh, was that uh, we give the prize to the person who made the best service to this respective discipline in the previous year, in the previous year. And we'll see that this is completely um, disregarded. We don't do that. We give the prize. In the case of Parisi, for instance, it's for research he made in... Uh, before the 80s, in 1978, 79. So very old work. So um, we don't adhere to the letter of what Nobel wanted to do. And by the way, and this one looks true, it looks like this is actually the case. Nobel decided to, um, to make this prize because uh, someone inadvertently, by mistake, announced his death in a newspaper and uh, he wrote an obituary. So he wrote a little tribute to Nobel, but it was really negative because you might know that Nobel now he's known for his uh, patroning of the intellectual uh, feast of the human mind, but before that he was not for inviting the, um, the, the dynamite, right? Which is something with which you can make war, you can uh, kill people. And the newspaper obituary was uh, insisting a lot on the fact that he was someone really negative for the history of humankind, right? So Nobel decided that to compensate, he should be with success. He was really, uh, he saw that correctly. He should uh, attach his name to, uh, to, to all these beautiful um, uh, awards you know, in, in all the interesting disciplines. Okay, the prize itself. Uh, so a few facts that to keep in mind. The ceremony is in December the 10th, in honor of the death of, uh, uh, of Nobel. Actually, I believe nobody uh, pay attention to that. The ceremony itself is not important. What's important is who won the prize. And this happens much earlier in October. That's why we give the lecture now. It's delivered in Oslo for the peace and in Stockholm for the others. There are as many as you see there, with a few hundred uh, nominees per prize, and they are kept secret for 50 years, which means that you don't know if you get the Nobel Prize until after 50 years. Eventually, you might have been nominated. Some people like... Uh, uh, Bell, for instance, of the Bell inequality, died too young to get the prize, but he's been nominated many times. So at least it's not a posthumous um, compensation, but at least you get something. Even though you don't care if you're dead, right? Um, because one rule, I don't know if I put it there, uh, one rule of the Nobel Prize is that you cannot give it posthumously. If you're dead, that's it, it's over. So Gandhi, for instance, who was the, the ideal Peace Nobel Prize, never got it because he was murdered before he could get it. And the rules are as follows. So either you get it for yourself, which didn't happen since the last time. The last time it was for Sharpak in the 80s, French Nobel Prize. And the, and the, and the year before it was to uh, De Gen, Pierre Gilles De Gen, also French. So these two French men were the last two to get it for themselves. Since then it's been split and the rules are like this. It's one third with one half for the main guy and one fourth for the two others, or one half to two people. So this year we've got this configuration. And you get a few things. You get mainly the reputation. You get uh, some money, $1 million, or I don't know the exact sum now. And you get a diploma. The diploma are interesting. I invite you to look at them because they are not known. I mean, I don't know why they are not displayed. 
but uh, you can find some of them at least, and they are piece of art. They are made by an artist, and they you would recognize here if you can see my mouse the costarly starless uh, transition in 2D condensed matter effect. Not unrelated to what we we'll discussed today, um, 2016. This is for the Ginzburg uh, theory of superconductivity. It's related to the topic of our previous lecture of the IOP by Varlamov, the Psi theory of superconductivity. And uh, yeah, it's one that's related to peace, I suppose, and Solzhenitsyn, so in literature. So very, very nice uh, things. If you're interested in the science uh, or not on one year, it's uh, nice to look to chase for this, uh, this artwork. The only one that we see because the press relays them is this horrible draw, well, this, uh, this sketch, this drawing that they make of the, of the Lorraine. Okay. And um, that's how it works. The, you, you might be asking, you might be wondering when I show you this stuff, right? So mainly to say that there are lots of different steps. The dates are cut, the months are cut on the, unfortunately, but they go in order. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, October, we are there in number uh, six, where the Nobel Prize is announced. And importantly, in December, so that's the last one on the right, number seven, there is the ceremony where the rate give the lecture uh, in person and they uh, sometimes write a text as well. So there is uh, both a long lecture and there, there is the address at the king and at the queen. And they are, they are very, very interesting for historical purposes, right? Because there they can uh, say how they see the field, what they think about people who didn't get it, if it's uh, fair or not, uh, interesting things. And uh, why I put that? Because something that starts to become more and more popular, which is good, I believe, is that people um, speak about it. They comment on these things. So you can find on Twitter, for instance, on the day of the prize announcement, some people, they write a series of, uh, of little comments on their personal personal appreciation or understanding of the prize um, or the, uh, the scientific journalist, this interesting quanta website, they, they, they put some uh, retrospective of, so a lot of communication of outreach, which is going on around the science, not only the laureate themselves speak about what they did in December after the, the, the dinner with the king, um, but also the, the society as a whole is taking more and more interest in this. And I, I believe this is very nice. And we are part of this. What we are doing today, discussing in more or less informal uh, context, something between Twitter and Quanta and the Nobel Prize, I would say. We'll try to get the science uh, in the middle. Okay, um, and what makes the Nobel Prize very interesting, this one is from literature, right? Of course, is the uh, social aspect, is the human aspect, not the, the cold art science, not the textbook aspect but uh, our people react to it, right? There is this, uh, you might recognize maybe this Irish, but well, it looks Irish, um, Nobel Prize, Bernard Shaw, who said that he would have forgotten Nobel to invite, to invent the, the, the dynamite, at least he could forget, but not to make the Nobel Prize. So the overall round and the, the newspaper obituary, right? And um, Bernard Shaw, when he was uh, offered the Nobel Prize, he declined it, he refused it. And many people uh, refused the Nobel Prize. But interestingly, I believe all of them eventually um, took it anyway. So Bernard Shaw, he took the Nobel Prize. He, he is in the list. He, he got it. So he says, because the wife told him, if you don't do it for you, do it for Ireland. So he accepted the prize. But at least he refused the money, right? He didn't take the money. Um, but the money, of course, is not the most important. What is important is to become uh, immortal. A Feynman, very important thesis for all of us. Yeah, Richard Feynman, he also said that he despised the Nobel Prize, that uh, for him the fun was to uh, understand, he was not to get the recognition for whomever, for a queen uh, somewhere in a strange country. So, of course, he was not interested. But when he got it, so he made the show like Feynman does all the time. It means that he, 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 he didn't take the phone call. He said, please don't bother me with this, I'm sleeping. But still, like Bernard Shaw, he accepted both the money and the prize. Um, there is the French philosopher Sartre, he refused the prize, uh, and, and this one, he didn't get the prize, but not because he refused and stand by his decision, he, he didn't get it because it was too late. When he changed his mind, Sartre, and actually it seems that he changed his mind because he needed the money, so he wanted the prize for the money, uh, it was too late, and the committee told him that, no, we are sorry, now it's too late, so we'll not get it. So uh, Sartre didn't get the Nobel Prize, but uh, the fact that he wanted it uh, a posteriori is not to his credit. And people who didn't get the prize uh, who, who were nominated, but didn't get it, mainly for political reasons. So Pasternak, I believe, uh, was nominated, but he was uh, prevented by the political regime to get the prize. There is one exception, one interesting exception. It's 1915. You certainly recognize Edison on the left and Tesla on the right. They were uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize, and they refused it, and they didn't get it. But the reason why they didn't get it is interesting is because they uh, hated each other so much that they refused, both of them, they refused to share the Nobel Prize with the other guy. 
They say, okay, I'll take the price, but if you remove this one, that was from Tesla and vice versa. So they, uh, they uh, actually had to give the Nobel Prize to somebody else because in this condition, the Nobel Prize doesn't want to give two independent Nobel Prize. And that's what happened. So you see that uh, hate of people is stronger than everything else, than pride, ego, ethics, everything else. So it's a very uh, strong motor of things, the hate that you can have. Okay, so let's look at the Nobel Prize in physics. And I'll stick to physics this year. So um, why it's important? Because it makes you immediately famous. If you're uh, someone famous and important and you don't get the Nobel Prize, then certainly you will be forgotten in the history of science and you are not consecrated, right? And um, I like to put to command this uh, picture on the right. If I move my window so I can see it myself. Here we've got something which is similar to Edison Tesla. We've got three famous scientists. I love this picture. That's probably my favorite picture of, of scientists, of the industry of science. This is the, um, the train station in Stockholm of these three people who get to get the Nobel Prize together. The year is 1933. We've got Dirac in the middle, Eisenberg on his right, and uh, Schrodinger on the extreme right. And they get the Nobel Prize for quantum mechanics. At the same year, even though they were nominated in different years, but the ceremony was the same year. And it's very interesting for so many details in this picture, yeah, for various reasons. One is that a bit like Tesla and Edison, some of them, uh, Eisenberg and, uh, and Schrodinger in particular, were enemies. They disliked each other very much. And you can see the difference in character. You can see the, the Eisenberg was a bit intimidated or awkward. And the flamboyant uh, Schrodinger on the extreme right in his Bavarian attire with this fur and these uh, shorts and, uh, and the tie, which is uh, not even a line. So it, it tells a lot, right? What is interesting as well is the ladies who are with them. So nowadays, uh, there is a lot of insistence that uh, women should get the Nobel Prize as well. And this year, there's been some controversy that nobody, no discipline was female. And Parisi uh, had to say something about that. But these three women, they were not coming for the prize. They are the, the women that accompany, they are the, the partners, you would say nowadays, right, of these three people. And yeah, as well, there is something really interesting that there is the wife, I don't know which is which, right? But there is the wife of Eisenberg, the wife of Schrodinger, and there is the mother of Dirac. So he didn't come with his wife, he came with, he came with the mother. And interestingly as well, we cannot say which is which. I don't know if the one in the middle is the mom of one of them or the wife. So we could go on like this over and over. You see, this is one snapshot of the history of science that was taken thanks to this, um, to this protocol, to this bizarre tradition we have to honor interesting people who do interesting science. And thanks to that, we've got this beautiful picture of which we could discuss over and over. There are many things to read in these things. Okay, I need to click again there. And uh, now we go to, the, um, to this year's thing. So I'll start with the uh, climate uh, people because I'll actually focus a little bit more on Paris -y. because as I said, Paris -y is the one who who's more famous and certainly the work is uh, more important. And maybe I should apologize when I say that, but I shouldn't apologize too much because as I said, nowadays, you know, there's they, they a lot of social uh, media, a lot of uh, journalists, a lot of, uh, of, um, of things like that, that that go on. So actually, the, the newspaper or the, the journalist, they have asked to the laureate themselves what they, if they thought they deserved the Nobel Prize, if they were expecting it, right? And this guy, Manabi, uh, I don't remember the, the, the first name, is Sukiro, I think Sukiro, but somehow the people call him Suki. Okay, so uh, Manabi, he said uh, very uh, candidly, he said that no, it was a complete surprise for him. He didn't expect it at all, which is good. I mean, it's modest and humble, but since he's a scientist, maybe we can trust him to be um, honest and to tell us the truth. Parisi, on the other hand, when they asked the same question, he said, oh, you know, yes, I was expecting that uh, it was likely 20% uh, uh, probability I would get it. So I was keeping the phone um, uh, charged and nearby just in case. So you see the difference, uh, the, the perception that these people have of themselves and uh, the importance of their work and the importance in the grand scheme of things. So starting with uh, Manabi, Suki Manabi, born 1941, a Japanese scientist, but he made most of his career in the United States after the war. So you see him here uh, explaining to someone, you recognize which one is, uh, is Suki, right? So he's explaining uh, some, uh, some result of his computer model. So he was hired to model the climate change. And uh, of course, you would do this with a computer, basically. But at the time, uh, Suki, uh, he realized that uh, the, um, the climate change is too difficult. The weather is too difficult to simulate with the computer. So he had to make simplification. And that's the big input he did for science. And that's typical of physics. That's the job of a physicist, basically, is to uh, pick, to cherry pick what is important, what matters, 
and throw away what is uh, anecdotal, what is a secondary, which is a complication that will not change the essence of the problem, right? So he did this, he said, okay, this looks important, I will keep, uh, this looks not important, I will remove. So for instance, dimensionality doesn't look like it was important because he made the 1D model and uh, it turned out to be correct. And uh, he, he predict, he, he correctly identify that the convection, so the movements along the, the altitude, the 1D model, remember, of the, of the atmosphere was important. So that's what he did basically. And it's called the Manabi uh, climate model. He, uh, he chose what would be the very important variable to put in the computer. Then he put the, uh, this in the computer. So he designed an algorithm and you see the equations are not too difficult, right? Uh, there are even one the equations and he, he did something basically which is computer numerical method. And he got some uh, results. These results are uh, illustrated like this by the Nobel Prize. And so very importantly, the point is that um, the, the, the physics of this, so Manabi is not the one who proposed this model and he didn't even understand most of the important thing nowadays of this. This comes from much before, from much earlier. It started with Fourier actually. Fourier understood that the atmosphere was the uh, main uh, component, the main uh, actor in deciding the temperature on earth. And uh, people like uh, this one, what I'm showing here, the most important paper of Manabi, which is this one with Weatherall. But I want to show this guy. Zvent Alenius, also a Nobel Prize, not of physics, but of chemistry, and the old one, 1903. And Zvent Alenius was, uh, was a polymath. He has interest in everything, so chemistry, of course, but also in the climate. And he's the one who uh, made the, basically is the one who identified the most important uh, component to decide uh, what affects the climate or not, in particular, uh, water, uh, vapor of water, that's the most important uh, part, and, uh, and dioxide of carbon, CO2. That's the one that affects the water vapor and that ultimately decides on the, on the sensitivity of the, of the temperature on these things. So you could say that, um, that what Manabi did is a tractable uh, model of Arrhenius uh, model, I'm repeating myself there. So he made a tractable version of Arrhenius model to put in a computer and make sort of um, accurate uh, prediction of the, uh, of the climate which means of the temperature and uh, things like this. So that's the main result, maybe, figure 16 of this paper. And that's certainly, the, that's probably, in my understanding, the most important paper of Manabi. So you show, we see here on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, the temperature at the surface of the, of the Earth. And in context of global warming, then we would like this not to go too high. And on the uh, vertical axis, the altitude. So 1D model, it means uh, how far we go in the atmosphere, how, how far we climb. And um, the point there is that Manabi realized that uh, if you are changing the density, the amount of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere, then you would change the temperature here on the, uh, on the surface of the Earth. So the fact that it doesn't seem to change a lot, right? It changes much more upper in the atmosphere. The point that it changes upper in the atmosphere is regarded as an evidence or as a proof that CO2 is directly responsible for that. That how much CO2, CO2-3, how much dioxide carbon we put in the atmosphere is responsible for the temperature we feel on the floor. Because if it would be for some external reason from the sun or for whatever, then it would be uh, uniform. While uh, the, the fact that is it uh, depending like this there is such a sensitivity on the density of CO2 is regarded as a proof of its importance of CO2 precisely. But again, importantly, these results have been obtained by uh, Arrhenius already. He didn't have the computer, Arrhenius, who's seen doing everything with pen and paper, but he already shown that if you are doubling the amount of CO2, then you would increase the temperature by such and such many degrees. And I don't want to, to be too affirmative on that, but it seems to me that actually the figure of Arrhenius are basically as accurate as the one obtained by the computer model. Here, there is um, a timeline of these things. And as I said, so you see Fourier very early on, it described the contribution of the atmosphere, it was understood early on. And you see, uh, where is Arrhenius? Is there, uh, if you see my, my mouse, he was calculating the warming from doubling the, the CO2 amount, okay? And we find uh, Armand Abbey and, uh, and, and Witherold, so the co-author of the paper that got the Nobel Prize, at this point, where they put their model that was good for the computer, where they could make a great uh, description. And at the top, 
So I'm hiding myself my screen with all these windows. At the top, you see the temperature since it's been recorded, and we've got this so-called killing curve that we can look at it more detail because that's a typical thing that people look in context of climate change. So let's zoom on this one. But before we zoom on this one, I let you notice that on this timeline, which was produced uh, before the Nobel Prize, on this uh, on this timeline, there is the name of Manabi, but there is not the name of uh, Asselman. I don't find it anywhere. Okay, so it looks like uh, Manabi is uh, somehow more important, more foundational. It appears in the timeline, not the other way around. Okay, so let's look at the uh, at this killing curve. So this killing curve is the curve that uh, that someone that belongs to some US department or something. They are collecting the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and they are doing it uh, every day. So actually, this was from October 26th, yesterday or two days ago, this measurement. It was at uh, 412, I think, ppm, part per million. So they are making these very accurate measurements. So that's the that's course of uh, over the duration of COVID, I would say. That's how uh, CO2 is varying. And, and they are measuring this over various amount of time. So that's the one we've seen before. That's the famous curve that you've seen many times, I'm sure, the killing curve. It since it's being recorded, it started there, and then it's measuring how much CO2 is going on. So there are these uh, fluctuations because it's a complex system, the climate change throughout the year, but it otherwise uh, follows the neat trend of increasing. And if you look, if you bring this very accurately measured tabulated killing curve to over evidence we have from other things, so ice, ice core data, I think it's linked to the to measurements they make uh, in the ice from the Antarctic or things like that, they're able to see more or less to estimate the concentration of CO2 we have. And you see that indeed there is uh, a sharp increase since uh, since the early on, yeah, since we, with us, it's contemporary. Before, in, in 18th century, before the Industrial Revolution in particular, there was no such sharp increase. So this is the first strong indication that um, that man has some activity, it has some influence on the CO2 concentration. And the CO2 concentration is known since at least are in use that it is affecting the, uh, the water vapor and that the vapor, water vapor is something that Manabi's model shows in more detail, is crucially uh, affecting the temperature on the surface. Mechanism is simple. Huh? We don't look at the equation, but the, uh, the light comes from the sun, Light is energy, it's visible energy. Earth is a black body, so it will uh, radiate its temperature. Because temperature is small, fortunately, uh, the black body radiation is not visible. It falls in the infrared, and this infrared is interacting with the thing in the atmosphere, in particular water vapor, but also CO2. And if it's being trapped, then we get this uh, greenhouse effect. Greenhouse effect is something really uh, popular in Britain. Everybody in his backyard has a greenhouse, and English people, British people, they know or to get a big temperature in their otherwise uh, fairly um, challenging climate to grow flowers and, and fruits and things like that, right? So the point is that CO2 and uh, water vapor, but mainly CO2, uh, they are very strong uh, greenhouse gases. So their concentration matters a lot on that, right? We can uh, expand this killing curve over, over a period of time. I think that's the that's the most we have thousands of years ago. So pay attention on the x-axis. And now we are looking over uh, much before we, everything started, much before we had anything, not even computer, but even uh, pyramids. So we are going very far backward in time. And you see there are a lot of oscillations, right? Which is discussed a lot in this climate change thing. People tell you, now, yeah, now we are increasing, we are warming, but we add uh, cycles of warming and cooling throughout history. This is documented. So the point here is that if you look on the extreme right, you see this killing curve, nice squeeze on the extreme right, is going uh, higher and faster. So faster we don't see because it's it's uh, it's all squeezed in this scale, in this linear scale, but it's going much higher than everything that has been ever recorded, even through in, uh, indirect um, uh, measurement. So the, the statement is that uh, there, there is a problem here uh, that we are warming the planet. And why is it a problem? Because it could lead to a positive feedback where uh, the more we uh, warm the planet, the more it will, it will become indeed warm. Yeah, the more it will become warm, it will become warmer. Uh, and that's where Asselman comes. Because so far, Manabi and Ari News and Fourier, of course, all these people before this one, or people like him, they were not they were not concerned about uh, about political issues or problems, right? Uh, that it's bad to warm the planet or not. They were just studying the, the weather, the climate. 
And with Arsene Mann, it comes something else. It comes the um, it comes the question that oh, we are warming maybe too much. We should be careful, and uh, we, we should change things like have policy to reduce the amount of the CO2 we put on the atmosphere or things like this. So here we see Arsene Mann uh, doing some climate computation on the supercomputer. And it's a more um, recent version, more recent picture where he's celebrating. So hopefully he's not celebrating the result of his computer simulation because they are quite uh, bleak for us. He's celebrating the Nobel Prize. So at least there is some satisfaction in, uh, in everything, right? Because you can predict um, doom, but if you get a prize for it, then you can still celebrate. So let's look a little bit at what he does, this Arsene Mann. He himself, so as far as the science is concerned, I will not look at the science too much, but what he did is to integrate very short um, uh, fluctuations and chaotic fluctuations in particular uh, that happen on a daily basis or on a weekly basis or something that happen uh, punctually, like uh, here we've got volcano eruption or maybe uh, some tornado somewhere, thing like this. He connected that to the long-term evolution of the climate. So you could say that he connected weather and climate, where weather is defined as the time, the meteo of today or next week. And it's well known that this is something that cannot be predicted accurately. The typical chaotic system, you've all heard about the Lorentz uh, oscillator or the butterfly effect that if a butterfly is being squashed by a Chinese somewhere, then it will make a tornado in uh, New Mexico. Um, so how can we uh, predict the climate given that the weather itself uh, is not predictable? That's basically uh, the answer uh, that was found by this close Asselman. He developed some method to average so it's a statistical thing. He average this chaotic noise and he shows, or he claims that he can, uh, like this, uh, predict the climate on long time scale. And that's the typical figure we see to illustrate his achievement. We've got in black what really happens. In blue, what would happen uh, according to his model if we remove the, uh, the CO2, extra CO2 that is produced by man. And in red, what happens if we take into account the uh, human um, contribution? And the red match the black. Therefore, it means that a human is responsible for warming up the planet. Interestingly, here you see that it stops. So it works very well, of course, but it stops right at where we are. So it goes in line with a very famous uh, saying we have in physics, which is that it's difficult to predict, especially the future, right? So we are more interested maybe in uh, this kind of plots where it has been extrapolated. And there, not surprisingly, the magical uh, red curve that match the black curve perfectly not splits into different curves, right? So you can understand that there, there's been some trimming. There are some over curves that don't match what we see that have been removed from the computer model, right? So if we put all the curves on the computer model, well, at least they have something in common, which is that they all increase. So we are indeed warming up the, uh, the planet and it could lead to uh, removing the iceberg everywhere, flooding uh, everything and turning uh, our, our planet into some uh, desert of some sort, right? Um, and, and here, so the point of this computer model is that they tell you how many uh, CO2 you should remove to arrive to something which is, which we can hope to survive by year 2100, right? If we don't want to live in a place where it's eight degrees more on average, which means that certainly it will be 70 degrees in the shadow outside, uh, we should not produce such and such amount of CO2. This is uh, being recognized this year uh, by the physics prize. Interestingly, all this has already been recognized, in fact. Um, and that's my picture of uh, the previous Nobel Prize. So not for the lady on the left, uh, Greta Thunberg. She didn't get yet the Nobel Prize. I've got no doubt that she'll eventually get it uh, in peace or, or literature or something. Um, but the one on the right, uh, Al Gore, Al Gore, he got the Nobel Prize precisely for this in 2011. Not for the equations. There is no Al Gore model as far as I know. He got it. Uh, I used to say last time, in particular last year, I was already commenting about this uh, this strange Nobel Prize in 2011 for peace. It was for peace. I used to say it was because of a PowerPoint presentation because that's what I've seen. I've seen him giving PowerPoint presentation, but actually it looks like that is it's for a movie, a movie which is called uh, An Inconvenient Truth. I haven't seen the movie unfortunately. I didn't have time. I should have, but uh, to prepare this talk. But I, I'll have a look, and um, I wonder if Asen Man and uh, and Manabi are featured in the movie of Algor. But okay, so that's for the climate change. I will not go into too much detail, as I said, and we'll go to, um, to Paris. So one last thing, uh, there is this uh, statement here. We can no longer say that we did not know the climate models with the S are unequivocal. This doesn't come from the movie of Algor, although I'm sure it was there in this form already, but this comes from this year's accolade uh, from the Nobel Prize to the Laureate, right? When they describe what they did and why it's important, why it's interesting. 
it also comes with this very interesting thing, which is unusual in physics, right? Where we got this warning that we shouldn't say, we shouldn't complain when it's too late, yeah, because we know. That's a funny thing to see. Okay, and now let's turn to Parisi. So Parisi is the condensed matter um, uh, theorist who uh, got the Nobel Prize uh, for half of its value for the uh, spin glass. That's what we're going to discuss. Uh, Parisi is a bit like Arrhenius, actually. He was a polymath. He didn't start in condensed matter, like many very successful condensed matter physicists. He started in, uh, in, uh, in high energy physics. He made the, uh, his physics with, uh, with Cabibo, who people from the standard model know for the Cabibo angle. And uh, he worked in a lot of different things. Uh, actually, we know him. I, I knew him myself, particularly for the, um, for the KPZ model. He did also things like uh, stochastic quantum field theory. Uh, of course, all this condensed matter work for which he got the Nobel Prize. High energy physics, he described the structure of the, um, of the, of the nucleus. So really someone who touched a bit of everything, including things, which is typical of genius people, things that you don't expect. Like uh, he, he made this uh, nice paper on the, um, behavior, so critical behavior of people, scientists that attend the conference and how they react to the deadline. So as you get close to the deadline here, the, the number of people who pay the, the fee uh, exhibits this divergence. And then they discuss uh, con, uh, thermodynamical aspects like a critical exponent in relation to this. Usually we do this precisely with boring system like a, a magnetic um, alloys or things like that, right? Uh, but he actually did it with people attending his conference. So he's organizing a conference and he's studying uh, people. He also made a very nice paper on the dynamic of, uh, of this flock of birds. These uh, sterling birds are they? But well, they make these beautiful panels. So that's how Parisi, when he looks at this in the sky, that's how he understands it through his uh, equation. So he is writing a correlation function between the velocity or position of the birds. And that's at the art of condensed matter physics, it is the this notion of correlation. So correlation is the amount of, of link, uh, of agreement or disagreement, how one thing is connected to something else at a given position and at a given time, right? So we all know that correlation is not causation and there are some subtleties, but uh, basically that's how we measure. We try to find some order, some structure uh, throughout the uh, space and time of something, which could be a cloud of birds, or in the case of Parisi, the spin glass. So we are going to discuss the spin glass now. And what is spin glass? So it's a glass. And what is glass? So glass is one phase of matter, right? We know glass, we've got it everywhere. I've got one for my coffee there, that's glass. And uh, maybe the most important thing to know about glass is that it's different from a crystal. So a crystal is a periodic arrangement. So highly ordered, highly structured organization of the atoms or molecules that make up the, the material. The glass is uh, amorphous. So it's really more like a liquid doesn't have this order, this line, nice, neat arrangement of the constituent, it's disordered, amorphous. Um, actually, uh, I put this picture, the one on the right come from the Wolfhampton people with the blow glass there at the university. And I took this picture to show that there is water on both of them, yeah? And uh, when you make a glass, you need to cool it uh, quickly because otherwise it doesn't, uh, it doesn't go into this ordered crystalline phase it goes into this, uh, it doesn't go into this amorphous phase, which is glass, it can crystallize. So you should be careful if you want to make glass, not to make a crystal. So there is, uh, th th there is a difference of this type, which is uh, one that we should keep in mind when we discuss spin glass, because spin glass actually, they share this property of uh, being amorphous with the real glass, except that they are stable, not like the, um, the real glass, which is unstable as compared to uh, crystalline order, the spin glass, is uh, stable. You don't need to cool it very quickly. And uh, I put this thing that I found on this uh, interesting website, Wine Folly. So the difference between uh, glass and crystal actually is of interest for people who are amateur of wine. Yeah, uh, you can read, I'm not reading it, you can see, do it for yourself. What is the advantage and inconvenient of the glass? What specificities matter or not? The uh, take home message is that it's much better to have a crystal than, uh, than the glass if you want to drink wine. It's much more, much more posh more better, except for the most important aspect, which is, of course, the, uh, the taste. Apparently, glass is better because uh, being uh, amorphous and inert, it doesn't uh, spoil the quality of your wine. Next time we get the, the talk from Varlamov on the gastronomy uh, physics, we, sh we should ask him if this is true that the actual glass is better than the crystal. Okay, so let's come back to the spin glass. So spin glass, it's something that doesn't look too interesting. It looks very specialized. You remember the 
the accolade for uh, Parisi was that he, he understood disorder and fluctuation from planets to, uh, to whatever, to molecules and everything in between. But actually the system itself, it looks kind of boring, right? It's, a, it's an alloy, which means that you are mixing some magnetic thing, like, I don't know, uh, magnesium or iron into something else. So uh, gold or zinc oxide, whatever. So that's what you got on the right. You, you put a bit of, of magnetic element and you dilute it. So it's a dilute magnetic alloy. That's what is a spin glass. As compared to a regular magnet, which is more like, um, more like a crystal. There is some order. You see everybody's pointing in the same direction. It's not the case for the spin glass. Where we've got this first important characteristic of the system is that it's disorder. All the spin point in different direction. Okay. And uh, an important thing of the magnet is that there can be two uh, mechanisms, two basic way for the spin to interact. It could be that they want to align, this we call flow magnetism. They decrease their energy if they are aligned. Or on the opposite, they want to be anti-aligned. That's anti-flow magnetism. Yeah, that's what they want to do. And that leads to the other important thing of this spin glass that you don't have in many other uh, systems, which is frustration. Frustration is when you have two different um, things that cannot be happy with each other. So Paris himself takes this very interesting uh, case where you make two groups of people and uh, some people are friends with uh, others and the others are friends, uh, are enemies with others. Yeah? Um, and for the thermodynamic stability, it shouldn't be that you are friend with someone with your enemy. So you are either friend with someone or you are enemy with them. And then how would you make two groups of such people? If it's if impossible, most of the time it's impossible, or if you make three groups, for instance, to have a group where you only have your friends and in front you only have your enemies. So you have this frustration where sometimes you have to compose with your enemies. And we see it here for this interaction of the spin in the spin ice. Uh, the red is leading for some anti magnetic uh, material where they would like to be opposed. You see that if you've got three spins here, you can never make everybody happy. So these two spins are not happy because they are in the same order. But try as you might, there is no way to make everybody happy. So you have to take into account this frustration. So spin glass, we've got this important thing. We've got the disorder and people speak of quench disorder because the disorder is fixed. It doesn't uh, move, it doesn't diffuse in time. It's fixed by where your, um, your impurities are, and it's frustrated. And then if you look at the, at the behavior of these things, so that, now if you do what a physicist would do to try to look at the, what do we have here? I think it's magnetic susceptibility and the specific heat, the so typical thermodynamical quantities on the y-axis as function of temperature, you see this behavior which to the uh, trained eye, to people who do quantum, uh, sorry, who do condensed matter physics, so students of Anton in particular, they are familiar with this shape. It means, or it points to some phase transition. So something happens there, and then there is some reordering, or say something interesting. Here we've got the reference of the first discovery of the um, of the um, of the spin uh, ice of the spin glass, sorry, spin glass um, in in this paper. So it interests uh, very much someone who is called Anderson, who is very famous to condensed matter physicist. He's kind of the of the pop. He's the Einstein of condensed matter. It's, really an eminence in the field, and he studied this system. He wrote this Hamiltonian, which is known as the um, Edward Anderson Hamiltonian, and he did like Manabi did for the climate. What he did is that he described a very complicated system with a lot of structure, amorphous, a lot of things. He dropped all the complicated uh, things and kept only the important one. And you see that the important one, there are not so many, there are not much of them. So if you are not familiar with notation, would not go in detail, of course, but uh, very quickly. So the H here is to mean that it's uh, the energy, the Hamiltonian, we call that. So that's the energy or the cost function of the system. The J is to mean that it's quenched, that the disorder has been fixed and we don't change it anymore. Then you've got the sigma, sigma X and sigma Y, they refer to the orientation or the spin. So if it could be a, an, an Ising type of, of interaction, it would be plus or minus one, up and down only. In other model, Eisenberg or whatever, it could be rotating in very 3D or 2D, it doesn't matter. So it's the degree of freedom for our magnet that's described by sigma, sigma X because it's at the position X and Y is at the position Y. So it's pairwise interactions, two of them interact and it's nearest neighbor interaction, which is what these uh, brackets show on the, on the lower part of the sum. It means that we don't take into account the spin if they are too far. And then importantly, we've got this J here, which is the coupling strength. So sigma is the magnet and J is how much they interact. And this is random. So that's the disorder. So we call quench disorder. It means the distribution functions, the coupling between them can be small or it can be big. And this is decided by chance, by throwing a dice. So it's a disordered random system. 
and here is the coupling for some external magnetic field that will try to align this pin, right? So we've got this uh, dynamic of the system. And if we try to align them, given that it's random coupling and they are frustrated, some of them would want to be aligned, some of them are not, what will be the total response, the complete response, macroscopic or thermodynamic or statistical response of our system, of our Hamiltonian? That's the problem as it was formulated by Anderson. There comes this guy, Samuel Edward. I don't know if you know him, actually. He's not as famous as uh, Anderson. Even that is the real hero of today's talk, actually, because he's the one who got uh, the idea of the most important uh, trick, which is known as the replica trick. So um, Anderson uh, said to this guy, uh, Edward, he told him, uh, I've got this, uh, this system. I'm trying to describe the uh, diluted magnetic alloy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to do it like this. And, um, and Edouard told him, oh, but then we could try my, my, my method to, uh, to solve that. Because the point is something really important. Why this system spin glass is interesting? Why it's more interesting than an over crystal or something else? Because you can understand, for instance, that superconductivity, for instance, Anderson was working a lot as well on superconductivity, why superconductivity is important. If you've got a superconductor, we can make a machine, we can, make, uh, we can transport uh, electricity, this is important. What is the importance of, of uh, spin glass? What can we do with this? It doesn't look important. Why it was interesting Anderson, and that's why I put this quotation there, is that it was mysterious. It was not behaving, the spin glass, here, for instance, uh, through these quantities, or from over uh, observable, it was not behaving uh, as it should, according to statistical method. It was, it was having very slow relaxation time. It was going to a ground state, which was um, never the same. It was random. There was some remanent uh, magnetization. Uh, what else was there? That uh, if you were tra trying to change the, the thing, you had to increase very much the temperature again, so cross the threshold temperature, the critical temperature, and cool it down again. So it was behaving unlike anything that Anderson had seen. There was no interest whatsoever for this, no application. It was not interesting anybody. But because it was different, Anderson said, OK, that looks interesting. I'll study it. And that's the quote we have here. It says, a real scientific mystery. We should proceed till the end of the Earth. Uh, even though maybe it's not interesting for applications or it does no obvious importance. But because it's mysterious, we should try to work it out. And I will show you that it's paying to do this because it can get you a Nobel Prize, but also it has implication for things that go much, much, much beyond the spin glass. I also put this other part of the quote because he says that this is neglected by our masters who provide the money. I wouldn't have put that because everybody complained they don't get enough money, right? So it's, it's a trivial point. But I put it because it speaks of our masters. And that's an interesting uh, adjective, right? In the, uh, in, in the pen of Anderson. So Edward, he had this trick, which is the replica trick. And the replica trick is an interesting one. It is that in statistical mechanics, when we want to describe something, Anton will tell you that we need to compute the uh, partition function. So partition function is this big Z here. It's basically the, um, the normalization, so the sum of all the probabilities of the configuration that your statistical make, uh, system can take. Yeah? It can be in this position with the spin like this with some probability. And if you look at all the probabilities, it needs to be normalized. So this Z uh, is there to do that. And out of the partition function, or the logarithm of the partition function, you can actually compute everything. You can compute all these statistical observable like this uh, magnetic susceptibility, the specific heat, free energy, whatever you want to compute, you can get from this logarithm of Z. So the point is you should compute the logarithm of Z that corresponds to this Hamiltonian, Edward Anderson Hamiltonian. But it turned out to be very difficult. Not only the uh, system, experimental system was weird, the theoretical simulation was really weird as well. The computer was not going anywhere. It was always finding a different solution. Uh, you couldn't go from one to the other easily. It was giving nonsensical results, negative entropies, negative energies. It was a big mess. It was very really difficult to understand. Using the, the normal method, like the one of Anderson and that, that he, he knew how to use. I remember, he was the, the magician of statistical method. So um, this guy, Edward, he said, I've got a trick. We can compute the uh, partition function using this replica thing. And uh, the replica thing is basically to say that instead of computing the logarithm of Z, you are going to compute the, uh, the integer power of Z, which is much simpler, okay? And the math, so you can more or less agree that the math works. I let you follow, it's not a very complicated algebra. The beautiful thing is that it works in the limit when N goes to zero. But actually when you apply the, the replica trick or method, you take integer power of N, values of N. So N is one, two, three, it's an integer. So it shouldn't work. There's no reason why we should end. And this is a very beautiful way that uh, physicists do mathematics, right? 
the, the best physicists in particular, the very creative one, the one who are scared of nothing. They, they laugh in the face of mathematics uh, rigor. I remember Schwartz was saying, Schwartz is a mathematician who got the medaille fields for formalizing correctly the Dirac distribution, which is function which is zero everywhere, except at some point where it's infinite. So Laurent Schwartz, who made the proper theory of that in math, he said that he once went to a, a talk of Dirac and he was sick. He, he, he wanted to puke uh, when he left the, 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 the seminar because he was so dirty what he was doing. And here you've got something really dirty because you, you are saying, okay, so to take the limit n equals zero, I will take n equal one to three because n equal one to three, I can compute. So nobody knew why at the time, at least, I believe now it's a bit clarified. Some people start to understand why is the case. But at the time, they had no idea why it would work. Just it was working, it was giving results and the observables were corresponding to what it should. So they applied this replica trick, this replica method, being able to um, partition the uh, the uh, partition function to fractionalize the partition function in this way. And this was applied on the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model in the interest of time. Maybe let's not go too much into the detail of this, but that's important for the development of the, of the Nobel Prize of Paris. -E. So what they did basically is to look at a variation of the model. You see that uh, in the, uh, we've got basically the same coupling strand. It's very similar. It's also random there. It's also crunch. But what we have is long long-term interactions now. So each spin is coupling not only to the nearby, but also to the very to the, to the spin that are very far away. And that's where uh, Parisi entered the story. He solved this thing. This, he made the statistical uh, mean field theory of this Hamiltonian, the Shington Kirkpatrick model. Parisi could solve it in 79. And he could solve it and he could understand what the replica trick, he solved it using this replica trick of, uh, of Edwards, but he could also understand what it means physically. And it brought him to this uh, very interesting thing that there is uh, um, an ultrametric uh, space, ultrametric distance that is involved. So before I explain this tree, I'll tell you about the ultrametric space. So there is such a thing which is called the metric space in topology, the distance between three points. And usually in the metric that we know that we are familiar with, like Euclidean space, we've got the triangle inequality. We don't usually write it like this, we write it with the absolute value, but uh, it basically says that if you go from one point to the next, it's shorter if you go directly there rather than uh, passing by some intermediate points. That's triangle inequality. There are some space which are called ultra metric space, which have this stronger version of the uh, triangle inequality. The distance is smaller than the maximum of, of these things, okay? And these are some interesting consequences. One of them is that in such space, the distance between two points is at least equal to the distance between the two other points, okay? So the, uh, the triangle, which is cross start here is one which doesn't satisfy the thing, which means that all the points that are in such a space, they uh, live on some sort of isocyl. It's a space of, it's a metric space of isocyl triangle, if you want. And what um, Parisi understood, so what we have here basically is uh, the starting point, the one which is at the bottom of the tree, is the entire configuration space. It's all the possible alignment of the spin that you have in your spin class. And when you make this replica trick, when you take the, uh, the power of the partition function, instead of going straight for its logarithm, you are uh, making this power function. What you do is that you break the space in subtrees like this until you arrive at configurations, so replicas that are copies of the system uh, that have some, um, some relationship, the one to the others. And the structures of these points, these red points at the bottom of the tree, the structure of these things, as understood, as characterized by Parisi, explain why uh, all the methods of Anderson were breaking down, why you couldn't apply conventional statistical methods. Because there are things like um, the overlap between, uh, between configurations that are uh, very different, but we give the same value leading to a divergence of the partition function. So uh, we've got here on the left hand side this equation that the Parisi order parameter. Order parameter is a concept that was brought by Landau, I believe, which says that to describe the phase of matter, we can define a function that gives you the order of which shades you are in, right? And uh, what Parisi did, therefore, in more concrete term, is he identified, he understood, he calculated, he obtained the order parameter for the spin glass. And why it's important, why it's worth a Nobel Prize, this thing, is that the spin glass is unlike any statistical uh, system that we know about. In particular, it uh, leads to, um, it's non-ergodic, for instance, right? Um, it means that if you are in some, uh, in some uh, equilibrium point, you will not visit all the other points that have the same uh, energy. If you are in some state of energy, you are not visiting everything. So there is a different time scale 
this different dynamic in the configuration space of these things. Uh, the averages don't behave as well uh, as they should. And all this is, uh, is linked to this uh, special, to this peculiar um, ultrametric uh, distance or the way you should measure the, uh, the overlap between this replica of uh, the system. And, and this was understood, and now we go to why this is important, this understanding of the spin glass. This is understood to be connected to other things. Because for instance, I show you the typical uh, energy landscape that we, uh, we, we have in mind as physicists when we speak of condensed matter, something really simple, particular here to describe the, the, uh, the symmetry breaking mechanism, right? So we go from something that has one minimum, and it splits and it has two minimum. So now the system has to choose, it will choose randomly, it's breaking a symmetry, and that has a lot of consequences. So that's typical Anderson physics, right? But what Parisi and the spin glass brought is the so-called rug energy landscape, where instead of having something which is smooth and simple, you've got a system that is so complicated, it has so many different configurations and disorder and frustration working together, team up to make an energy landscape which is full of valleys, uh, full of minimum that are very far. So if you want to go from one point to the other, you have to take very complicated, very uh, circumvoluted trajectory in the parameter space. And it leads to a lot of um, of problems of actually it, what it does, it is breaking down the uh, paradigm of statistical mechanics or more than breaking it down is opening a new dimension. It's saying now we've got to look at the statistical mechanics, not of simple system, but of complex system. So that's why it's important. Not because we understand the spin glass, but because we understand that there are some system like spin glass of which spin glass is a particular example, but that needs to be described by statistical method that, that uh, go beyond go beyond equilibrium, they go beyond the simple energy landscape, they need to uh, collide with this thing which is known as complexity, complexity in the sense of, of computer people, of, uh, of P complexity, NP complexity. So it shows that we have to do computer science with something like this tree of possibilities that branch exponentially. Yeah, instead of bringing you to one point smoothly, nicely, take you by the end to the solution, is spreading into an infinite um, number of possibilities. And to describe the statistics of this, you need this method of Parisi. So I'm giving you here one typical uh, problem of complexity theory, the, the uh, traveling salesman problem. You've got a lot of blue points, which are the cities you want to visit. What is the shortest path? Actually, it's very difficult to find the shortest path. You have, in a sense, to try all the possibilities with a computer and find the one which is shorter, which happens to be the one on the right. Good luck to, to find that this is this one, which means you understand uh, if you go there, for instance, and you change the order, you go first there and there and then here, you've got a longer distance. You don't find the real optimum. So this uh, problem is one that explodes like the ground stage, like the possible ground stage was spin glass, is the one that explodes with the number of cities you have to go. Like the ground state of the spin glass explodes with the number of impurities you have in your system. Um, and I put this thing because it's related a bit to, to Anton and I uh, field of topic where we have some people who are looking at the spin glass with polytons, but let's not discuss too, too much this in detail. The point is that you see that people, they use systems that are spin glass or close enough to uh, something that looks like a spin glass to uh, build so-called simulator, yeah, a simulator of this X, XY Hamiltonian. It means we can find the ground state of complicated system uh, by looking at its realization. But more interestingly, and I'm going, I'm getting to the end of the talk, it also has application, for instance, for things like evolutions or, um, or the brain. And that's my uh, last slide before conclusion. Um, people who look at artificial intelligence, for instance, you know that artificial intelligence is one of the exploding topics nowadays. Everybody is interested in, in this thing. And the method of, uh, of Parisi, they have a lot of, uh, of impact, a lot of implications for this field. But it's precisely the type of things that would tell you that you can go to one local minimum, one replica of the system, or the over and going from one to the over would require you to, 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 um, to go very higher than the uh, energy landscape, the barrier that separates them. Even though they are very close in energy, you have to take a big detour in parameter space. And in this way, people have understood things like uh, memory, for instance, the long-term memory in our, um, in our brain it is believed that it is related to the basic physics of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick or the Edward Anderson model that describe this weird uh, magnetic phenomena that we find in the spin glass. So basically it's not the spin glass that, uh, that Parisi got the Nobel Prize for. This is just a pretext. I mean, 
that, that's the model which brought him there. If not neither, I wouldn't say that he got the Nobel Prize for understanding the, uh, the effect of disorder and fluctuation from planet to atoms. This is a strange way. I think what he got the Nobel Prize for is for finding once or for describing, for giving the first correct mathematical description of a non-equilibrium statistical um, problem that is involved with complexity, that has complexity embedded. And then you can make the link with other guys of the climate because they also, are, I don't see any more direct link than that, that they have a complex system because of this chaotic uh, behavior of the climate. Okay, so that's my conclusion. I hope that uh, I brought all the, uh, all the fundamental, all the essential keywords of the physics of, of policy. Uh, we've seen uh, the ultrametric space or so new topologies to describe these things. Uh, there is the replica symmetry breaking. I didn't speak about that, but symmetry breaking is uh, is involved in, uh, in in pretty much most of the statistical uh, mechanical phenomena, and it is there in the spin glass. You have to make a symmetry breaking of the replicas themselves. This replica trick, which is not the one of Parisi, used it. It's been uh, introduced by somebody else, and uh, and the complexity, right? So it's bringing together, it's tying up together neatly, very beautifully extremely important, fundamental, and far-reaching uh, concepts, right? If you want to understand uh, the brain, ultimately, not only for the artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which, which uh, maybe is not that interesting in itself, but the behavior of the brain, what is memory, what is the, our cognitive ability? Well, this might be related to how this little spin orient themselves in a dilute magnetic alloy. Okay, so as the conclusion, I will use this uh, that comes from Anderson himself, he was, uh, he concludes on his own interactions with spin glass. He was saying that this peculiar feature, so one of them, whichever it is, I think it's non-ergodicity or the fact that the spin glass doesn't work according to standard classical textbook or Anton uh, level six uh, condensed matter uh, physics, the fact that it's breaking, he said it was enormously annoying at the time, at the beginning um, uh, of one of the, uh, let me read it completely, this peculiar feature, enormously annoying at the time, was the beginning, okay, now I'm back on my feet, it was the beginning of one of the most important discoveries of modern theoretical physics. So that's the Nobel Prize of Parisi, is one of the most important discoveries of modern theoretical physics. A discovery comparable to that of chaos in its broad applicability to science. But we, we is Edward and Anderson and his friends, we didn't quite understand that yet. So I hope that with this little lecture, uh, we understand a little bit better the impact and the importance of Paris's work. With this, I finish. Thank you very much. And Anton, if you're back. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you Fabrice for, for this brilliant talk. So uh, the attendees, uh, you are invited to type your questions uh, in the chat uh, window or if there is a possibility uh, to, well, you can also, as I understand, you can also raise your hands and our IOP uh, host uh, can uh, let you, uh, can let you speak if you don't, if you don't like typing, as I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so at, I, see at the, that, I see that there is one question, which is that, is there a problem with the sound? That we, ah, it's, uh, it, it's from the very beginning of the lecture. So it's not the sound, it's not the sound, it's my accent, uh, David Webb. It's not the sound, it's just my accent, I'm French. I think there was no problem with the sound. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, may I uh, use my position as uh, the chair to actually uh, start asking uh, questions while uh, while the others are typing them. Uh, actually, I had one question, uh, uh, well, uh, that was haunting me for uh, almost all uh, of the lecture, uh, all, all, all lecture, right. except, uh, except, okay, so you actually answered it in the very last slide before the conclusion. Uh, so the, the, the question was about the link between the two parts of your talk and uh, the two parts of the Nobel Prize, right? So uh, one on the, let's say, uh, cli uh, the climate aspect and the other, well, uh, awarded to uh, Parisi on, uh, on chaotic and com complex systems, because the, the two fields are uh, very, well, they seem to be very different uh, uh, until, until the very end, uh, until the very last slide, I think you were only 
mentioning the equilibrium, the physics of equilibrium systems uh, treated uh, by, addressed by uh, Parisi. Uh, so, for, for, for example, that the physics that relies on uh, the notion of partition function, whereas uh, the physics of uh, climate and the physics of Earth is strongly out of equilibrium. So my question was, uh, what, what, what's the, the link then? Uh, is it in the methods, the mathematical methods applied to, applicable to both kinds of systems? Or uh, it, it, was it something else? Maybe you could comment on it. Uh, the, the short answer is that in principle, there, there doesn't need to have a link between the, the prize. It's not one, uh, it's not one requirement that uh, the, the prize are directly linked or, or get a clear connection. If you look last year, for instance, uh, last year was Penrose, was on black holes and the other people, well, there was the black hole, yeah, because they were looking at the, at the trajectory around the black hole. So there was definitely um, one little link, obvious link. But the, the year before, the year before, it was Muru and his, uh, and his student, Strickland, who were developing some, uh, some method to concentrate light and the optical tweezer uh, of Ashkin. And uh, this one uh, is, is a bit more remote, right? The link is not that obvious neither. Indeed, the link here is complexity, right? The fact that uh, we are dealing with, uh, with chaotic system, so to speak. So you can find a, a little link uh, in this way. Um, I, I would say as well that uh, precisely what Penrose, uh, no, sorry, not Penrose, what Parisi uh, worked on, maybe is more personal uh, input, was this, uh, this understanding of the ultrametric space. Yeah, this, um, how it affects this, um, this order parameter at the order parameter uh, gets uh, diverging or not because some replica are contributing uh, constructively to a given value that would lead without this method to divergences and, and make the quantities negative. So the amount of distances yeah, between these uh, replica that are different trees, different branch of the tree, uh, it, it can be very large or very small. And uh, it, it has this isocell iso triangle property that if you take any branch of the tree, the distances between them is uh, the same as any over two points. If you take one replica, it has the same distance to uh, any over two replicas that you take anywhere else in the tree. That's the specificities of this uh, ultrametric uh, space. And that's why they, uh, they have such consequences for the, um, for, the other parameter, for the other parameter. So the, the, the overlap, yeah? How much different things are connected, how much they are related, is at the art of the spin glass. So it looks like everything is in the spin glass. And to give a last, uh, a last comment on your question, um, people have asked, they have asked to Parisi what he was thinking about the climate change. Because of course, everybody, when they saw the Nobel Prize, they thought, oh, that's for the climate change. We didn't see that it might be something else. I don't think they ask uh, Asselman and Manabi what they thought about the spin glass or what they thought about, uh, about the divergence of the, of the partition function. But they asked Parisi what he thought about the Nobel Prize. And then his answer, might tell you maybe uh, from his from his words what he thinks about this. So he, uh, maybe I'm relaying a, a Parisi's answer to your question. And he said that yes, yes, it's very important, of course, and uh, uh, we should be responsible because if we don't do anything soon, if we don't act now, then we'll get in, in deep troubles because it's a, uh, it's a complex, it's a chaotic nonlinear system. And therefore it's uh, very important that we, we act right away. So Parisi, seems to be very personally involved in this problem of his uh, co-Nobel Prize nominees, right? He could have replied, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure. It's not, I, 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 no, he made a very clear statement that yes, 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 we should be very careful to what they say because it's very important. So there is a link, yeah? If Parisi had said that, what are you asking me? I mean, what is this question? It's stupid. Uh, it's, it's not at all what I'm doing. And then I would have said that, yeah, the, the link is very remote. But given that Prezi himself said that, no, no, complexity is very important. He actually, you can look it up, but he connected his work to the one of the two over. So he, he made this effort to build about the, the connection. So there are links uh, both in the plane of uh, physics and outside of this plane, let's say. I would say. Oh. So. Okay, so I'll start reading the, the questions. There is a question from Alex Wood. Uh, can you comment on the Nobel Committee abandoning the rule of rewarding work in the previous year? What do they What do they say about it? Uh, if they actually do say anything? Well, if they 
if they would if they would apply this rule strictly, that would be more interesting certainly. But definitely, it would be more chaotic. The Nobel Prize would be completely discredited already; it would be dead, because it's very difficult to recognize to identify the importance of work in the previous year. In fact, it almost never happens. It happens a few times. It happens for the Cuprate superconductors because that was an obvious, massive result. It was described as the as the what is this big concert they made uh, in the in the fields. Woodstock, it was described as the Woodstock of physics, yeah, because it was so popular, the APS meetings, they had, they had to put camera and television outside of the conference room. Everybody wanted to hear about it. Room temperature, not room temperature, high temperature superconductivity. The other was the Higgs boson, not to Higgs himself. I mean, Higgs got the Nobel Prize much later, but the CERN, they got the, the Nobel Prize the year after because it was regarded as a very important discovery. Even that it was not demonstrated that it was the Higgs boson. At the same time, some people who should have got the Nobel Prize for something that was clearly important, they didn't, never got it. Hawking, for instance, was not in the, well, he was dead already, but he made all he could to stay alive long enough, yeah? Because Hawking at 21, he told him, uh, the doctor, he had six months to live. So uh, from 21 to 80 or something, he, he lived several decades. So he could have got the Nobel Prize, but uh, no, he, he died. And then the one year or two after, Penrose got the Nobel Prize for something that, should have gone to working as well and other people like that so that has been overlooked but people or, or things or activities or results that should have gotten the nobel prize um, on the year on the same year or the, the previous year or after the following year it looks very difficult to identify i mean even this year in medicine everybody was expecting that the nobel prize will go for some particular uh, result yeah and it didn't go there mm. so uh, it's, it's, it looks very dodgy i think it's it would have been fun. It would have been fun if they, if they stick to the rules. Yeah? Who last year did something that deserved the most prestigious uh, award, honor bestowed on the human uh, intellect. But it would be full of mistakes, of course. So we, we, we could have another uh, Nobel Prize for uh, Drosovson in, uh, in the field of his uh, current research, for example. Well, it would be discredited by now. That, that's what... Well, what for instance, yeah, do. I don't think it's ever been uh, considered uh, highly this, but, uh, but it could have been that uh, at some point he looks uh, good enough and then... Well, it's certainly ex an exaggeration, but uh, anyway, uh, that exactly. would be fun. You know, th th there is this so-called uh, Nobel Prize, uh, how do you call it, the Nobel Prize of sickness or problem or whatever, that after you get the Nobel Prize, then you become crazy and you start to do junk science. <laughs> Many Nobel Prize are, are disregarded or or disqualified, uh, even though they got the Nobel Prize, if they do things that are unpleasant or, or, or not uh, or not considered very highly by the peers, then we blame it on them having got done the Nobel Prize. Controversial, that's the word is, that is used. Right? So there is a question from Sana, Sana Khalid. Uh, how much of an effect uh, will the wins of the Nobel Prize give to uh, future works in physics in particular. I would even extend the question in for future works in the particular field of physics. Would, would it have any effect uh, on the field judging by the previous years? I would say no. I mean, it has definitely for the scientists involved who becomes like a VIP, someone who travels everywhere and uh, he's get invited to speak about the same thing over and over. So for the scientists, maybe it's killing their, uh, their activity, their production. Wouldn't it attract more physicists into, into yeah, the field? Of... That's the question of Sana, yeah. And, and there I wouldn't say, I wouldn't think it's the case. First, because, um, because it's like all the things that happen in the news, right? It, it makes the buzz on the day and the, and the following day, everybody has forgotten already. As I said at the beginning, in December, which is when the real, the real Nobel Prize should uh, concentrate the interest of everybody, where the, the laureate will receive formally the prize and go through all the decorum and the protocol, but also give their lecture and share their experience of the historical recollection or how they got there, what they think, or their vision of the field. So that's the interesting bit. And I believe very few people speak about it. Yeah? When it's announced, now you will see everybody who come and say, oh, look, that's a picture I took uh, with the Nobel Prize myself uh, at this conference. We were uh, bathing together uh, in, the, in this place, or we had a drink together, or that's how I understand what they did, or that's what I... 
everybody is very excited on the day. But three months after already, or maybe one month, it's October, two months after in December, the interest is completely uh, dumped out and uh, nobody takes any interest whatsoever. So if it does affect the interest in the long term, I would say, no, I don't know anybody who says, I, I want to study that because, um, because uh, the, someone got the Nobel Prize for it. I don't think it's the case. I might be wrong. Huh? Maybe you've got a different opinion or perception of that, but I, I okay. don't see it. I wonder if anyone has consistently studied it. <laughs> Stati uh, applying statistical methods. Methods of statistical therm mechanics or thermodynamics. Okay, so there is another question uh, from Alison McMillan. Uh, does, uh, so apparently another question on the social aspect. Does giving a Nobel Prize uh, give uh, a person too much credibility when speaking on other topics? Well, um, probably, uh, I mean, if you got the Nobel Prize, um, Parisi also answered this question, interestingly. I, I read an interview he gave to El Pais. It was in Spanish because he was translated, so I don't know if he gave it in English, in Italian, or if he speaks Spanish himself. But he was saying that um, if you got the Nobel Prize, then uh, you have to, uh, your voice will be heard, and then you have to use this to say things. Because he, he had some kind of activist uh, um, activities uh, Parisi himself, in particular, for instance, regarding the funding of research in Italy, which is notoriously bad. Yeah, it's remarkable that someone like Parisi, who, who stayed in Italy all, all his life, I mean, maybe he had some short stay elsewhere. With my understanding, he always studied in Italy, uh, around Rome. Yeah, in uh, La Sapienza, I think where he's now, but Frascati, or and, uh, and and funding of research is is very small in Italy. But uh, still, you can make uh, you can get the Nobel Prize if you are Parisi. Fermi, for instance, most famous uh, Nobel, Italian Nobel, he got it from the United States. I don't know if you can see he was an Italian. He was Italian himself, but the science was from Chicago, right? Or from Los Alamos. So. Uh, but Parisi is really the, the real deal. He's the real Italian scientist. And then he, he, uh, he made a lot of intervention, is my understanding, on the political side to request more funding. And, and he commented that uh, having the Nobel Prize now is his responsibility to, uh, to speak because his voice would be heard. So he has this responsibility. So in his understanding, if I'm not uh, betraying his, his intended meaning, you have such higher prestige, credibility, and you should use it. That's what he thinks. Is it okay? Well, I would say yes. Anybody who gets, uh, who gets recognized, who gets uh, awarded something, uh, of course, is regarded better by the other, right? Everybody wants to invite you now. The, uh, the, 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 um, this woman, Strickland, who got the Nobel Prize, she was not even on the Wikipedia be before she got the Nobel Prize. It's even mm -hmm. worse than that. It's even worse than that. Someone had put her on the Wikipedia because at some point she was the president of the, of the o Optical Society of America, uh, but she was removed because he was not able enough to do that. Yeah? So, um, and then she, uh, later on, she was recognized as be worthy enough to get a Nobel Prize. So not to be on the Wikipedia, but still important enough to get a Nobel Prize. So now you can imagine that nobody, nobody would ever dream of, of removing uh, this woman from any place, yeah, let alone the Wikipedia. So she's, she has raised considerably from being someone that not even a, an editor, an anonymous editor of the Wikipedia would take seriously to someone now who we see regularly. Yeah, you see her giving talks, uh, being invited in, uh, here and there. So, Everybody is interested or seems to be interested now in what she has to say. Well, before it was even too much that she's been put on the Wikipedia. So definitely being recognized as having the Nobel Prize, it confers to you a lot of, a lot of, not power, but a lot of uh, prestige. Mm -hmm. So there is a comment rather than a question uh, from Dennis Silverman. Hopefully the Nobel for sorry. Hopefully the Nobel for climate calculation calculations will help disperse the idea that the confirmation of climate change is still in doubt. So fr uh, from your lecture, I uh, at least my perception was that the climate change is uh, itself is not uh, doubted. Uh, it's 
uh, it's actually the contribution of Ha Salman, right, which you mentioned, which is the so uh, the so-called fingerprints or uh, related to this fingerprints or the human effect, uh, which he isolated from other effects, which is causing controversy. Controversy, right? Maybe you're, that- you're reading too much in what I I, I said about that. Um... Well, I, I didn't discuss too much, I think, uh, this aspect of the controversy or not around the, uh, the climate change. What I would say to Denis Silverman is that this is a positive view of it, that hopefully it will help to uh, make something true, better accepted. That's the positive view. The negative view is the other way around, is that they got the Nobel Prize precisely for that, precisely if you connect it to Brewery's question, to uh, silence the possible controversy or opposition to this or, or alternative interpretation, yeah? Which means that it would be a political motivation to give the Nobel Prize for that. That's the negative view. Uh, controversy is good in science, in my understanding. Yeah? People should, uh, should discuss, should debate, they should confront ideas. This must be decided by science, but controversy should be there. So uh, how did you formulate it? You say, disperse the idea, disperse the idea of a doubt. So uh, I wouldn't say that we have to disperse the idea of that. I would say that we need to do good science and see where the evidence goes one way in another. Well, that's that's the positive view on on things on the current current situation. I would also <clears throat> say uh, that uh, I will also inc- and encourage our students to uh, to watch this lecture in recording at least those. Uh, who uh, didn't att- attend it. And in particular, uh, this uh, last slide conclusions with the focus on the keyword annoying. So hopefully that will motivate uh, this, the, the, the students and uh, make them relate to the fam- famous and great scientists of, uh, of uh, the past. For the one who was asking the question about the previous year, I don't know if it was Denise as well, but you see that in the case of Hasselman, it's a bit difficult to give a Nobel Prize without making a leap of faith because uh, his predictions are for the year 2100. So if we have to wait uh, 2100 to see if his curve will fall with where we, uh, we will be then, then the poor guy uh, will not make the rule of still being alive to get the prize. So sometimes we have to, uh, to speed it up, so to speak. Uh. So there are there are two more questions in uh, in Q and A window, and one of them, as I understand, is related to what has been discussed. The climate from David Webb. The climate system is similar to your spin glass surface in the in that uh, there are many different states with different energies, but due to the energy from sun, the system easily moves from one state to another. So which is probably a definition of a non well. Uh, the way to see it, that the system is non-equilibrium. So it absorbs energy from sun. So how is the Parisian ideas relevant? What am I missing? How is the Parisian idea? Re- how is the Parisian ideas relevant? What am I missing? Uh, yeah. Uh, so how how is the Paris, uh, Parisian ideas of... Um... Relevant for the climate change? Well, mm-hmm. if... That's what you are seeing yourself. If you understand that there is a lot of uh, of microstates that are very close in energy, and we can move from one to the other, then possibly I don't think it's the case. I don't know. I don't believe, but I don't know if it's the case. Then this uh, this replica method and this uh, replica symmetry breaking could have a role there to describe the climate. It could be the case. The point is that it's been identified for, in the in the op field network, for instance, in the neural network. It's been identified that these ideas of Parisi they are relevant. They explain things. It's believed that memory is uh, long term memory is connected. The mechanism for that, which was a mystery till uh, some time ago, so at some point nobody had a clue how it could be possible, why it's stored, or in which form, it is related to this non ergodicity of the spin glasses, and this is explained by this replica structure of this branching tree. Maybe for the climate, the same. I'm not too sure because uh, climate will, would, yeah, as, as uh, Anton said as well, uh, climate is strongly off equilibrium. Yeah? While in the spin glass, we are still looking at statistical quantities in the sense that close to equilibrium. 
So we lose some properties like ergodicity or, uh, and we are not constantly at equilibrium because you can't the system or you perturb the system. There is this notion of annealing, for instance. Yeah? So we mean that you need to uh, crank up very much the temperature to go very high, to cross again the, 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 the transition, the phase transition threshold and come back to converge to a different solutions. So Otherwise you are stuck somewhere. This is this idea of metastability that links to long-term memory. Hmm. So co connections, they are definitely, right? They are now at which amount, which level? That's what I try to, to say to Anton is link to how, how, how do you measure your overlap between things that are very different? What is the overlap between one replica and the other from different uh, branches of the tree? Yeah, you can compare in one branch or in two different branches or still over branches. So it, it looks a difficult problem. So I don't know what you're missing, but certainly we are all missing a lot of things. Even Paris and et al are missing a lot of things, right? It's basically, if, we, if you look at what Anderson says there, the most important, one of the important discovery of modern theoretical physics, of course, an important discovery in modern theoretical physics will not capture, will not exhaust its implication, its meaning in one uh, IOP talk given by uh, someone who is not an expert of the topic, right? Is for generation and generation to understand our memory, consciousness, evolutions, everything is related to this, uh, to this physics. So perhaps one, one of the uh, last questions. Uh, the abstract mentioned anecdotes, injustices, curiosities, and mistakes. And uh, the question is, can you mention any of, uh, of yeah, those? You are, you are teasing me there because we are, I see that the time is passing, we have little time, and, uh, and there I could speak for another six hours on this. There are so many of them. I don't know which one to choose. Um, Sudarshan, for instance, poor Sudarshan, yeah, is someone who constantly uh, has been... Uh, skipped in the nomination of the Nobel Prize. Sudarshan is someone who worked in a lot of different fields, like Parisi, like Einstein. So uh, he, he predicted very nice things, like the tachyon, like uh, the, uh, he did the theory of quantum optics, um, the quantum Zeno effect. And in several occasions, he felt, and many people uh, with him felt that he should have been mentioned, but he was skipped. A bit like maybe, I don't know if he's still alive, uh, Edouard. Anderson got the Nobel Prize, yeah? but Edouard, for instance, didn't get the Nobel Prize. And he should have. Uh, De Gennes got the Nobel Prize for basically his work on polymer physics, right? Mm. So uh, at least De Gennes got it alone. Huh? You remember Eugène and De Gennes and Charpak, the last two people who get the Nobel Prize without sharing it. The, the full thing, very prestigious. Uh, even Dirac, uh, even Eisenberg, Dirac got it alone. But even Eisenberg and Schrodinger had to share. So, um, so Sudarshan uh, was skipped many times to the point where he, he was fed up and he actually made this very pathetic, very sad thing. He wrote a letter to the Times to complain and, uh, and whine, yeah, to say, I didn't get the Nobel Prize, it's not just, uh, uh, and, and speaking badly of the guy who got Nobel, of Glober. Yeah, he was saying, oh, yeah, Glober, he did this, but it was not so, so important. After all, it was my idea. A bit like a kid, like who is frustrated, right? And, and that's interesting because uh, you, you see the, this internal uh, fight between what Feynman was saying, the fun is in the, is in the nobility of understanding, exploration. I've got fun because I explore, not because I get recognized by the other. But there is a snapping point at some point. Yeah, When you are teased and you are pushed and you are saying, no, we skip you, we skip you, we skip you. It's like an experiment. It's poor Sudarshan, what could he do? He had to reveal his true human nature that he was frustrated, he was, he was hurt, he was pained by that. That's one of them. Another one which is very interesting is Bardin. Bardin, he got two Nobel Prize, right? Bardin. Uh, the first one he got for the transistor, and there he got it with Bratton and Shockley. And, um, and Shockley was the, was the boss of Bardin, and he took too much credit. He invited the, the journalist, and he said, okay, so you will guide Bardin and Bratton, you, you, will, uh, you will go behind me for the photo, and I will sit at the microscope and look at the transistor. And this, this very nice picture, you see Bardin who is making a face of disgust and disappointment as he's looking at, uh, at his boss uh, getting the Nobel Prize for what was basically his idea, his input. The real input for the Nobel Prize was, um, was Bardin. He had to share with the friend who made the device, so that's okay, but he also had to share with the boss who did little less than maybe discussing at coffee or giving him the money, but didn't do the science. The genius of the transistor is Bardin. So he was very much pain for that. And then he decided to change completely the field 
So he did something else. He took what was the most difficult problem at the time, which was the, the problem of superconductivity. He said, okay, I'll solve this problem. And like this, I will, I will show to, um, to, uh, to uh, Shockley who is really worthy of the Nobel Prize, if it's him or me, because good luck for him to get the Nobel Prize on something else. So he hired two uh, specialists in different disciplines, Cooper uh, on, um, Cooper on, on, on field theory, on high energy physics, like Parisi uh, initial work, and Schrieffer, a PhD student, so a postdoc, a student, a lot of cigarettes and coffee, and he said, okay, let's solve superconductivity. And they did. They did. Bardin, Cooper, Schrieff, BCS, Fury of Superconductivity. So he got a second Nobel Prize with which he could finally show that he was the genius, not the other guy who tried to uh, get the, the, the credit uh, out of it. And interestingly, interestingly, that connects us to the gentleman that uh, Anton commented, Josephson, there was an obscure, unknown guy, not even a doctor, still doing his PhD student, Brian Josephson, who was kind of stalking Bardin in all the conferences. He was standing up and he was telling him that uh, if, you, uh, if you make, a, if you put a, an insulator between the two condensed phase, two superconducting phase, there should be some tunneling. Was telling him of some effect that he, he had imagined, very simple one that you could write on the back of an envelope, and uh, and Bardin was coughing that he was saying, of course not. Uh, please uh, remove this guy. He's, he's idiotic. He's, he's harassing me. And it was true. It was true. Josephson uh, was correct, and Bardin was wrong. You see, it's very nice um, moral to the story that you can be twice is the only one who got two Nobel Prizes in the same field in physics. Yeah, some people got it in chemistry and physics, in peace in physics, maybe in literature and uh, agriculture, I don't know. But he's the only one who got it twice in physics. So you can regard him by this definition as one of the most brilliant and most impressive physicists ever uh, who ever existed. Even Einstein only got one. Even that, they left open the, the door for him to get two because in this uh, Nobel Prize, Einstein, it was mentioned explicitly we don't recognize your work on relativity. We leave this for later. So it, it was like kind of telephone. Yeah? Einstein, you could imagine he would get a second one, which might have been deserved as well, probably. Yeah? But only Bardin got two. And he has been, I don't want to simulate it, but he's been proven wrong. He's been defeated by a, a young person with a very simple, obvious effect. And you have to recognize, because that's the case with climate change, I hope, physics is science. It's not personal decision. You are proven wrong or right ultimately. He was proven wrong and he recognized, but he said, okay, I made a mistake. Uh, the young guy is correct. He, there is such an effect. So that's another anecdote. Uh, and, and there is, who is asking this? Alex, Alex. There are lots of such anecdotes, plenty of them. Why did Einstein didn't get a second prize? Well, maybe because um, someone commented, I think it's Mermin, I'm not too sure. Someone commented that after uh, the Anus Mirabilis, as they call them, Miraculous Year for Einstein, which is 1915, it would have been just as good as Einstein uh, retired from physics and went to fish because everything he did was a failure and was in opposition with the trend, which was uh, this uh, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, so on and so forth. So Einstein, he did fantastic things still 1915. Special uh, general theory of relativity, gravitation, and then all these other attempts, uh, like a theory of everything or unif unified, making a, a version of quantum mechanics, which was not quantum mechanics, there he failed completely. And somehow he fell out of favor, or he was not as successful. And relativity was, uh, I don't think the problem was that he was not accepted because he was splendidly recognized. Yeah, there is this thing that you should not give the prize if it's not clear which was the reason for Hawking. For Hawking, he didn't get the Nobel Prize because they say, okay, the theory is nice, but we don't have direct evidence or clear evidence enough of the black hole. Therefore, as it's maybe something that doesn't exist, it's just mathematical play, we wait. And then the poor guy died. But Einstein, so if he, if he would have kept being the, 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 the perfect uh, magician who would uh, solve the problem as he did till 1915, then he would have got a second one for sure. Bardin got a second one because he did that. Yeah? He solved the, uh, the BCS problem, uh, which was really difficult. Many people tried and he found the solution, which was very elegant, very beautiful, very useful. It's a really success story. Yeah, and b b both stories involving Bardin are 
are encouraging and motivating, I would say, from both for sides. You. For you. For, and for, for, for our students, I hope, as well. For the students, yeah. Exactly. So if you, are, uh, if you fail or if you are disappointed or frustrated to take the terminology of today, well, carry on. Do it better. Uh, another question from Alex Wood. You mentioned they left uh, the door open for relativity. Uh, another question. Yes, I think Thank so you. because if you look, if you look at the at the nomination, the accolade, the, the, the description. So for Parisi, I don't know if they left something open yeah, because now that he connected disorder and fluctuation to everything in the universe, what else could he do, the poor guy? But for Einstein, it's for the uh, theory of photoelectric effect and over services rendered to theoretical physics not regarding your work on relativity or something like that. If you read the, the mention in detail, you can find it on Nobel Prize website. They specifically rule out relativity. Okay. It was precisely for the photoelectric effect, which is weird because that might be the least important contribution of Einstein. The, I mean, there is the fridge as well that he put a patent for a fridge, but the photoelectric effect is not that important. Yeah, It's regarded sometimes as, as people as... Uh, as evidencing the quantum uh, nature of light, but this is not true. You can also do it semi-classically. So photoelectric effect is certain, I mean, it would be, should be for relativity, of course, both special and general. You could have got two prizes for the two versions of relativity, one for the space-time and the other for gravitation. So uh, there are also comments thanking you for your uh, and praising your talk. Great talk, very informative, and dare to say also entertaining. Uh, thank you for a very good talk. Photoelectric effect is key to solar energy to solve climate change. Well, an interesting loop. Uh, connect, con connecting the two, connecting the Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect. And, uh, to to the current topic of the current year's Nobel Prize. Um, okay, so if if there are no more questions, I, I believe it's uh, it's time that we wrap up the lecture. Except the last thing we should do probably is to advertise the next lecture, uh, which uh, will be on the twenty fifth of November. Uh, so in almost a month. And uh, it will be given by Dr. Martin Benchik, Benchik, right, from Nottingham Trent University, uh, and it's uh, it, it is going to be uh, devoted to honeybee. Uh, I'm not sure if you can uh, comment uh, and say anything about it to motivate uh, well and our attendees to uh, watch this lecture, attend this lecture as well. But it's about only bees. What else can we say to make it attractive? Uh, I think the speaker, so it will be live. It will be live. Uh, so you can join it from wherever you are, from your bedroom like me now. But it, all, it will also be on site. So you can actually go to the theater at the university and meet the speaker, which is certainly better. And it will come with uh, someone who will play the cello because it's related to what you will speak about. So it certainly will be more uh, interesting and dramatic than this lecture because uh, there will be some performance. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all want to know what the bees are doing. So yeah. of course, that's one that I will not miss for anything. Yeah, I'm also looking forward to it. All right, so thank you again, Fabrice, for your lecture. Thank you, Anton. And uh, so everyone is welcome, uh, uh, as welcome in, uh, in a month uh, at, uh, at the next lecture. So hope to see you all there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.